Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, my co-host is Katie, and now that we actually have movie scenes, it feels like Order of the Phoenix is officially starting. Yeah! I actually have things to talk about this week. (laughs) It'll be fun. So let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 1, Dudley Demented, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. We took our yearly field trip to the Department of Backstory. Harry sweats about more than just the heat wave. Vernon and Petunia have a hard time understanding him taking an interest in local news, despite being the biggest rubberneckers in England. Dudley develops habits that should really put him on a government watch list. Harry's scar becomes the most shocking source of current events when its host life is in danger. And hormones plus trauma lead us down a path that puts the ass in sassy. During episode 117, Disorder of the Phoenix, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on all of the first half of chapter one being left out of the movie? Also... Would the Trace have recognized the accidental magic that Harry did to make his uncle stop choking him? Hey Ellen, hey Katie, it's Jackson here. So, my pot of ponderings for this week. So, for the first one, what did I think of the first half of Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 1? So, (laughs) I'm gonna have to say it. Yates! Yates! (laughs) I mean, yeah, maybe we didn't need every single thing. Like, we didn't need all the backstory. But, yeah, to see Harry sitting under the ledge, listening to the news, trying to figure out what's going on. Like, we didn't even get any of his hopelessness or his anger, you know, in that first part of the film. We didn't really see that feeling until later, when he was at Grimmel Place. So... Yeah, we didn't get our first bit of angry Harry, frustrated Harry. And I especially wanted to see sassy Harry. I wanted his sass at his uncle and aunt. Oh, God, I wanted that. We were built. We were built. And as for the second pondering, I think that it wasn't conscious magic. It was something inside Harry, some kind of instinct that just protected him. And that's why it wasn't detected by the trace. I think the trace only detects conscious magic, you know, whether it's deliberately done or accidental, you know, like wizard children who do accidental magic. I think the trace only really picks that up. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. Excited to get into the first half of chapter one. I'm going to start off with this specific pondering. I really think that the electrical feeling that Vernon feels trying to choke out my boy is a part of the wizard in like nervous system or something. Maybe the only reason he felt it is because he was touching Harry in that way. Maybe it's something that they can't really detect unless it's either too much of it to where something crazy happens like March floating across the skies of the subdivision or something intentional like what Dobby did in Chamber of Secrets. It's my thoughts on that. Just this being not in the movies, it seems like, you know, it's probably going to be the atmosphere of the rest of this thing. Like just in general for years to come, we're going to be here discussing that. Well, yep, they fucked that up. We ain't get it. We're not going to get it, but, you know, this is what we got, and I guess it's all right. I know this isn't a part of the first half of Chapter 1, but I really wish I was a part of that conversation about you not knowing that Rita Skeeter wasn't in this movie. (laughs) 
I could have told you that. That's why I was so pissed off about the little bit they showed up of her in four. Like, if that's the case, you could have just took her out completely. They put her in there for decoration. It was because she cute. And that's it. But not cute enough for part five. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Hey guys, Michaela here. First of all, it was another great episode this week for Just Keep Rolling. <laughs> so funny. Anyway, for my pot of pondering, as I mentioned on Facebook, I think the trace sort of works in two ways. It's a yes and no answer. So, as I said, the ministry could have felt that it was just Harry's emotions and that's how the trace could have picked up on it. And also, no, the Trace may not have picked up on it because there are some incidents where the Trace doesn't pick up on any type of magic that links to a witch or wizard's emotions. And the Ministry also will only react, really, or, you know, sort of fix it when the witch or wizard's emotions actually lead to accidental-type magic, such as, you know, blowing up your aunt. Yep, so that's my pot of pondering. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Katie. It's me and Marissa. Yes, I am finally making one of these. So I wanted to answer today's pot of pondering about Harry when he's hiding under the windowsill. So what I would think is that he does use unintentional magic because it seems like whenever he's mad, he just uses it because... Well, first of all, in Prisoner of Man, he makes ant martyrs blow up. And, well, in Chamber of Secrets, he doesn't because Dobby's there. And then in, obviously, Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone, he definitely uses it all the time. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your responses. Mm-hmm. Our trivia question last week was... What is Dudley's nickname from his friends that Harry uses to get his cousin's attention while they are walking home? His friends refer to Dudley as Big D, which, I mean, that's ironic, right? Because there's no way that boy's got a Big D. Why did you plant this in my head? I don't want to know. I had to think about it, now so do you. <sighs> Congratulations goes to Mike Riley! Woohoo! This is Mike's return to the winner's circle. We haven't seen him answer a trivia question in a while. Is he back to stay? Will he be starting up a new streak? We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into the second half of Chapter 1, Dudley Demented, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 1, Dudley Demented, Part 2 Harry loses track of time as he sits on the swing, lost in his angry thoughts, and the sound of voices causes him to look up. The street lamps cast a misty glow, silhouetting a group of people making their way across the park, wheeling several expensive racing bikes. One is singing a loud, crude song as the others laugh. Harry knows who they are as the figure in front is unmistakably his cousin, Dudley Dursley. He is as vast as ever, but after a year of hard dieting and the discovery of a new talent for boxing, there's been quite a change in his physique making him even more formidable than he had seemed to Harry in primary school. Though Harry is not remotely afraid of his cousin anymore, he still doesn't think that Dudley learning to punch harder and more accurately is cause for celebration, and all of the neighborhood children are afraid of him. Harry watches them crossing the grass and finds himself hoping they will turn around and see him. He wants them to start something because he's ready with his wand and would love to vent some of his frustration on the boys who once made his life hell. But they do not see him and he stops himself from calling after them, knowing that wouldn't be smart. They disappear from sight and he gets to his feet and stretches, knowing he needs to get home so he doesn't get in trouble for being out later than Dudley. He walks quickly down Magnolia Road and nearly catches up with them. Stepping into the shadow of a large lilac tree, he waits until the gang all says bye to Dudley, calling him Big D, and complimenting him on his right hook. When they all move on, he sets off again, moving fast enough to come within hailing distance of his cousin. Harry yells, hey Big D, and when his cousin turns around and realizes who it is, 
He makes fun of him, saying it's a cool name, but he'll always be Ickle Diddykins to him. Dudley tells him to shut it, but Harry continues mocking him, asking him if he can call him Popkin or Dinky Diddydums. Dudley doesn't respond, so Harry asks if he's been beating up another 10-year-old tonight, mentioning that he knows he did Mark Evans two nights ago. This time, Dudley snarls that he deserved it for cheeking him, and Harry wonders if he said that he looked like a pig that's been taught to walk on its hind legs, because that's not a cheek, it's true. A muscle starts twitching in Dudley's jaw, and Harry feels enormous satisfaction as he siphons his own frustrations onto his cousin. They turn right down the alleyway, and Dudley speaks up asking if Harry feels like a big man carrying that thing he's been hiding. Harry tells Dudley he isn't as stupid as he looks and pulls out his wand. The two boys bicker about Harry not being allowed, and Harry taunts his cousin more about beating up people younger than him before Dudley threatens to tell his dad that Harry has his wand out. Harry mocks him for being afraid of his wand, and Dudley retorts that Harry isn't this brave at night. Harry points out that it is night, and Dudley clarifies that he means when he's in bed. Harry wonders if he's supposed to be frightened of pillows or something, but then feels a cold sensation in his stomach when his cousin tells him that he's been talking and moaning in his sleep. Dudley puts on a high-pitched, whimpering voice and begins to say, Don't kill Cedric! before asking Harry if Cedric is his boyfriend. Harry tells him that he's lying, even though he knows he isn't, and when Dudley begins mocking him by begging his dad and mum for help, Harry tells him to shut up and points his wand at him. Dudley backs into the alley wall and, wishing he could jinx him, Harry orders him to never talk about that again. The two boys argue back and forth until Dudley gives an odd, shuddering gasp and all the lights go pitch black. The balmy air becomes piercingly cold and they are completely surrounded by silent darkness. Harry briefly thinks he did magic without meaning to, but then realizes he never could have turned off the stars, and looks around trying to see something. A terrified Dudley asks Harry what he's doing and begs him to stop. Harry tells him to shut up so he can figure out what's going on, but Dudley keeps protesting, threatening to tell Dad, and to hit him. Harry again tells him to shut up, but falls silent himself when he hears the thing he was dreading. Something drawing a long, hoarse rattling breath. Before he can react, a fist slams into the side of his head, knocking him on the ground and his wand out of his hand. He yells at his cousin for being a moron, then tells him to come back because he's running right towards it. He hears Dudley stop at the same time a chill creeps up behind him and he knows that there's more than one. He yells for Dudley to keep his mouth shut and desperately calls Lumos as he tries to find his wand. It lights up an inch away from his right hand and he snatches it up, getting up and turning around to find himself face to face with a towering hooded figure. As it glides towards him, Harry stumbles backwards and raises his wand to cast Expecto Patronum. Only a silvery wisp of vapor shoots from his wand and he forces himself to concentrate before trying again. Still nothing more than the silvery wisp, Harry begins to feel desperate, with no happiness within him. He finds himself thinking he will never see Ron and Hermione again, and as their faces burst into his mind, he casts the spell once more, and an enormous stag erupts from his wand and chases off the Dementor. Harry then bellows for the stag to follow him as he runs towards his cousin and sends the Patronus after the Dementor that is barely an inch from Dudley's face. With both Dementors gone, the moon, stars, and street lamps burst back into life, and the warmth returns to the air. Harry is drenched in sweat and cannot believe there were Dementors in Little Whinging. Dudley is curled on the ground whimpering, and Harry bends over to check on him when he hears footsteps running up behind him. He whirls around and raises his wand, finding his batty old neighbor, Mrs. Fig. He hurries to hide his wand, but she shrieks for him not to put it away, worried there are more of them, before declaring that she is going to kill Mundungus Fletcher. The movie opens up on a dark, cloudy sky and the WB logo, which it zooms in on and through. The title, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, appears as the music swells and also zooms in and through the words, focusing on a bright spot that expands to white and transitions to an aerial view of a town. 
A voiceover talks about how hot it is as the camera pans over the town until it is above a dried field with a playground, and then cuts to Harry Potter walking through the brownish grass. It fades to his shadow as he sits, unmoving on a swing, and a woman calls to some children that it's time to go home. Harry sadly watches the still-moving carousel as the mother and her children walk away, until his thoughts are interrupted by the arrival of Dudley and several of his friends. They are talking and laughing about a boy they beat up, and Harry addresses his cousin as Big D, wondering if he beat up another ten-year-old. Dudley and the four teenage boys standing behind him all stop laughing, and Dudley sneers, insisting this one deserved it. His friends mutter their agreement, and Harry sarcastically points out that they are very brave to face him five against one. Dudley retorts, saying he's one to talk, moaning in his sleep every night, and mocks him for being afraid of his pillow. He and his friends all laugh before he continues taunting Harry about Cedric, wanting to know if Cedric is his boyfriend. Harry meekly tells him to shut up, but Dudley keeps going, mimicking Harry's voice. He's going to kill me, Mom! He then cruelly asks Harry where his mom is, needling him by pointing out that she's dead as all his friends laugh. At this point, Harry snaps, jumps up from the swing, and lunges at Dudley, pulling out his wand and holding it at his cousin's throat. Dudley looks scared, though his friends continue laughing until the wind picks up and the sky grows dark. As a storm appears to roll in, Dudley's friends all look around, wondering what's going on, and Dudley just looks at Harry, wondering what he's doing. Harry insists he isn't doing anything as the other teenage boys run away. The two cousins stare up at the sky before they also take off running down a dirt road and into a partially lit, graffitied tunnel. They hesitate as the lights begin to flicker and the air begins to chill, showing their breath. Harry looks around in concern and finds himself face to face with a Dementor that grabs him by the neck with his scaly arm and lifts him up into the wall. He manages to choke out directions for Dudley to run, but the puddle on the ground has frozen to ice causing Dudley to slip and fall as he attempts to escape. He slides towards the other end of the tunnel, and a second Dementor swoops in and hovers over him. Both Dementors begin to suck the happiness away from the two boys, until Harry manages to pull his wand out of his pocket. He jabs the Dementor in the face and falls back to the ground, dropping his wand in the process. As the Dementor flies back towards him, he shuffles backwards as quickly as he can, grabs his wand, and yells, EXPECTO PATRONUM! A brilliant blue-white light forces the Dementor away from Harry, who then uses his wand to direct the light towards the Dementor that is attacking Dudley. As soon as both Dementors are gone, Harry rushes to his cousin's side to check on him, and an older woman appears at the opening at the opposite end of the tunnel. Harry calls her Mrs. Fig and tries to hide his wand as she approaches, but is surprised when she tells him not to put his wand away, since they might come back. So... Unlike last week, mm -hmm. this half of the chapter actually has corresponding film scenes. They do, they do, they do. And they actually correspond pretty well, though we do have the usual kind of minor changes that we see from print to silver screen. Mm -hmm. In case you missed the end of the last movie, this one starts off with a super dark and gloomy title card, so there's no reason to be surprised when shit starts getting real. Yeah, and this one is even darker. Mm -hmm. than the last one because I grabbed screenshots to make our stuff for Instagram and whatnot. Yeah. And I was just like, God, you can barely see that. And I had to brighten it a little bit so that you could actually read it because what's the point of putting a really dark picture? Right. I'm like, oh, wow, there's just a big black blob on there? Yeah. No, it says Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. I swear it does. Look. <laughs> anyway, we see a bright spot through all the doom and gloom. However, it turns out to just be the hottest sun in the history of ever. Or... At least England. From what I understand, England doesn't get that hot normally, so... It does not, what with it being so far north. Yeah. Yeah. As the camera pans down over the lovely little town of Little Whinging, we hear a news anchor in a voiceover talk about how goddamn hot it is. And just to show that heat, we see a shit ton of dead grass and what appears to be, at first glance, a crop circle. But it turns out to actually just be the saddest playground in possibly the whole world. So, of course, that's where Harry's going to go hang out. Of course. 
I mean... It really is a sad playground, though. You had him at saddest looking place in the whole wide world. Yeah. <laughs> it is the opposite of Disneyland. It... <laughs> I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> but like we said last week, there was a lot of yellowed grass. There's yellowed grass. And then we hear the news announcer say it's in the mid 90s. There is the movie establishing at least one thing from the whole fucking first half of the chapter. Yeah. yeah, we don't see Harry at first. We just see his sad, lonely shadow all by itself as he sits on a swing again all by himself. Right. Much like a shadow. For some reason, wearing fucking jeans, despite the fact that it's the 90s and cargo shirts are totally in right now. Yeah. And it's apparently mid-30s Celsius. Like, boy, what are you doing? Why are you wearing jeans? I am positive the Satchels of Assholes never got hairy any cargo shorts. Well, yeah, that's probably true. And Dudley is, like, really hard on pants, probably. Mm. As somebody who just recently did a squat in jeans and split the butt open, like, I can't imagine that Dudley didn't do that to some pants now and then. I've gone through my fair share of pant butts before. Yep. Yeah, so Harry probably only ever got the hand-me-downs that Dudley never wore and just grew out of, mm -hmm. like the jeans that Dudley refused to wear in super hot weather. I mean, but hell, cut-off shorts are cool right now. Like, just cut your jeans up, man. But whatever. You want to be uncomfortable wearing jeans? You do you. I don't care. Let's be honest. Harry is not a Ravenclaw. He's probably sitting there like, man, I wish I could cut these jeans, but I'm not allowed to use magic outside of school, so I can't do the severing charm on them. <laughs> Damn it. How do these muggles live? <laughs> Curse you. <laughs> Meanwhile, a mother hanging out in the park with her kid tells him it's time to go. The kid doesn't want to. However, it's hot as balls out. So mom's like, no, we gotta go. The kid, by the way, is wearing fucking flood pants or culottes or fucking whatever. I don't even, I don't even know what fuck kind of pants these are. But this boy needs some shorts too. Y'all are doing the 90s dirty. Yeah, I don't know what those were. That was... That was bad. It was bad. It said 95, not fucking 76. Come on. <laughs> what the hell are you all doing in there? At least that's what I think, until we see Dudley, of course. <laughs> this fuck is 90s personified, and it is hideously glorious. Oh, I started having flashbacks. Oh my god, he and his gang are all decked out in some of the most ridiculous looking clothing I've ever seen. Like, one kid looks like one of those mall cups with the blue and purple stripe on yes. it. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, Dudley himself is rocking a silver basketball jersey. I mean, come on. That's, that's fucking glorious, right? It really is. <laughs> it's terrible. Like, yes, he looks like an idiot. But A, he's supposed to. And B, it's 1995 and this was the style for douchebags then. And they don't get much douchebaggier than Dudley, so. They really don't. Mm-hmm. And this is basically dead on where we cut the book chapter from last week. Since we left Harry sitting on a swing in an empty park, mm -hmm. the main difference is just that the park was closed, so there was no kid, other kids, and the mother there. Yeah. Just Harry lost in his thoughts on a swing. That's what I do on a swing. I usually swing. I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> so I just sit. He hears something, and it causes him to look up. It started to get dark, so the street lamps are all just casting a misty glow, and he can see a group of people in silhouettes. Mm -hmm. But he immediately knows who they are because the one is just clearly, I imagine the cartoon outline of a very like vaguely Dudley shaped silhouette. <laughs> and he's just like, yep, that's my douchebag cousin. Yep. I'd know that rotund bastard anywhere. Anywhere. And then one of the members of the gang is singing a loud, crude song as the others laugh. And that's probably also a giveaway. Mm -hmm. Certainly doesn't hide anything. That's yeah. For sure. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when the street lamps came on, that was time for me to go home. Yeah. So so as you described Dudley as being rotund, mm -hmm. this is still accurate. However, it's a different kind of rotund. Because yes. dude's been working out. Apparently, he's very good at boxing. Why wouldn't he be? And it's made quite the change in his physique. He's gone from just being a brick house to a brick shit house. Facts. And it makes him even more formidable. Than he ever was 
when Harry was like around him all the time in primary school. Well, yeah, because now he's training to be an asshole. Yeah. On the plus side, Harry's not really afraid of him anymore. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the neighborhood isn't. I mean, especially the younger kids. Yeah. Sure. They pretty much are all afraid of him. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, yeah, no, my cousin's an idiot, but I don't think that I'm going to celebrate the fact that he can punch harder and more accurately. Yeah. In general, he's not the smartest, but... He has his moments. He knows when to not get punched. (laughs) That's a good skill to have. Yes. I'd like to think so. (laughs) <laughs> he watches them walking across the dead grass mm-hmm. and he finds himself hoping that they're going to see him. He's just like, turn around, come look at me, turn around, come look at me. I got my wand. I'm mm-hmm. super pissed right now. I could vent this frustration on you. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> he wants to start some shit. But he's smart enough. Mm-hmm. I will give him that. He takes Sirius's advice and he doesn't call out to them. Yeah. He just desperately hopes they notice him. Yeah. Just give a motherfucker a reason. That's all he wants. Give a motherfucker a reason. (laughs) They don't. They don't see him. Nope. They just keep on moving and disappear from sight. And at this point, he's just like, fuck, I got to get home too. Because he learned the hard way that he doesn't have an actual curfew. Mm -hmm. But he's late if he shows up after Dudley. Which is probably a good rule of thumb. Really? Yeah. According to the Dursleys, the proper time to be home is whatever time Dudley shows up. Yeah. Which, I mean, I'm surprised they give him that much freedom, but they don't want him around anyway. So, yeah. It's basically be gone for as long as you possibly can be, but be back before our kid is because we're locking the door and we're leaving you out there. Oh, and they would too. Oh, yeah. Totally. So he kind of catches up with the gang, Mm -hmm. but keeps back far enough. He actually hides in the shadow of a tree just so they don't notice him, because he's still being smart. Yeah. He's still following Sirius's advice. He's not looking for trouble. He's just hoping it finds him. Yeah. To be fair, it usually does. I mean, he hasn't had a problem with it before. Right. He is going to get some trouble. It is going to find him. That's just, you know, another part of his middle name. I would love for us to write out what his full name is with all of the things (laughs) we're adding on to it. Harry, James, Caps Lock, Sass, Marie, Potter. That's <laughs> trouble finding. <laughs> trouble finding. <laughs> meddling. Yeah, meddling. <laughs> but like I said, he's hiding in the shadow of the tree while the backpack of assholes says goodbye to his friends and they all leave. Probably just going off different directions. So mm-hmm. Dudley starts walking again and Harry like picks up the speed to really catch up to him and pretty much quickly gets to a point where he's within a hailing distance. Yeah. This, however, is one of the minor changes because movie Harry does not show that kind of restraint in the park. (laughs) He's not all about that at all because Harry just full on confronts the douchebags of assholes right then and there. (laughs) Douchebags of assholes. I love that. That's what we're getting right now. Douchebags of assholes. As they're laughing and yucking it up to themselves, Harry asks Big D if they beat up another 10 year old. That's super shitty. Well, just when you think that Harry is overreacting by suggesting that Dudley and his gang beat up a 10-year-old child, because that just seems low even for him, they all start chuckling as Dudley drawls and says, this one deserved it. Which, the fuck? What does a 10-year-old do to possibly... Okay, I teach things. I've seen 10-year-olds do things that maybe... No, no 10-year-old deserves to get beat up by a 15-year-old. That's just messed up. Right. And really, if Dudley says he had it coming, that just means that he probably just told Dudley the truth. But all his buddies murmur in agreement behind him, making you realize exactly how shitty this kid is really turning out to be. And his friends. Well, yeah. Yeah, shitty echo chamber, too. Facts. I mean, it was one thing when he was picking on his cousin, who's the same age when they were both 10, but it's another if you're 15 and still picking on that same age range. I'll get older, but your victims will stay my age. (laughs) Yes, I did just modify a Taylor Swift quote. Or a Matthew McConaughey quote, depending on how old you are. (laughs) Yeah, the original. That's what I love about these high school girls. I get older, they stay the same age. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's what I love about my bully victims. I, I get, get older, they stay, stay the same, same age. 
Eh? Works. Just works. Not that it would have been acceptable for them to pick on 15-year-olds, mind you, but it's just extra unacceptable for them to pick on 10-year-olds. Yeah. The fuck, man? Bullying is bad, kids. Mm Mm-hmm. Don't bully. Shitty. Don't be a douchebag of assholes. Words to live by. Mm Mm-hmm. I like to think so. And as Harry points out, at five against one, it was never going to be a fair fight. Yeah, five against one. Five 15-year-olds against one 10-year-old. That poor kid. (laughs) Dudley, feeling like the big man with all his cronies around him, begins to mock his cousin by saying he's afraid of his pillow, and then he moans in his sleep every night. His friends all laugh, because, well, they're dicks. Yeah. And this eggs Dudley on as he decides to put Cedric's name in his mouth, asking if that's his boyfriend. Who's Cedric, your boyfriend? But, 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 but. He's got the jowls going. Yeah. The Dursley jowls. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Cedric, your boyfriend? It's really sassy. Mm-hmm. But also re- just so middle school. though. So just, ugh. Just, ugh. That's all I gotta say. Harry tells Dudley to shut up in a meek but also warning voice. He's kind of like, shut up. And at first you're just like, oh, he's going to bitch out. That's the calm before the storm right there. Yeah, it's definitely. It's like, oh, no, you don't want to start this. (laughs) Big D, however, does not heed that warning. (laughs) And he just continues poking the bear. Poke. 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 Now, because he hasn't gone far enough... He brings Harry's mom into the mix, which that's just asking to get fucked up right there. Yeah. Could you imagine how he'd react if Harry said anything about Petunia? Oh, Lord. I hate hypocrites like that. I mean, if Harry called anyone his boyfriend, too, he'd... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who's P is your boyfriend? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) He asks Harry where his mom is, but then answers his own question by cruelly pointing out that she's dead. Oh, boy. Oh, honey, you done fucked up now. Yeah. Like, dude. You deserve everything you got coming to you. I mean, you did already, but now you really do. And Harry agrees, because he's completely done with giving a fuck at this point. And he snaps and jumps up, lunging at Dudley as he pulls out his wand and presses it right into Dudley's neck meat. That is the best way to describe that, but oh, that image. (laughs) It's a meaty neck. It is a meaty neck. He got his dad's neck. At this point, Dudley regrets not wearing his brown pants. But his friends theoretically may or may not have seen the wand, and they continue laughing. Honestly, even if they did, they wouldn't really have any idea what it was. True, yeah. Like, what are you going to do with a stick? Yeah, it probably did look hilarious to them that Harry was threatening Dudley with a stick. Yeah. You're going to poke him? Mm Mm-hmm. But at this point, the wind starts to blow harder around them, and the sky gets ominous and dark. Dudley asks Harry what he's doing, and Harry denies doing anything, as the douchebags of assholes all look around trying to figure out what's going on. But I mean, to be fair, that's a pretty safe bet that Harry's doing something when ominous shit starts happening. Yeah, ominous shit's happening, he's got his wand out, Mm -hmm. and it just went from hot and light to dark and windy and colder yeah something's happening something's up unless of course you're reading the book in which case that's not how it happened well though it is managing to be strangely similar and completely different at the same time oh just like goblet of fire yeah and all the books from here on the fuck out yep As already mentioned, Harry wisely lets Dudley and his douchebag of assholes gang leave without drawing attention to himself, but after catching up with them and seeing his friends depart, he can't resist calling out to his cousin and yells, Hey, Big D! Which was our trivia question and also the nickname used in the movie, so ding! Ding! (laughs) Yep. And when Backpack of Assholes turns around and realizes who it is, Harry makes fun of him, saying, It's a cool name, but he'll always be Ickle Diddy Kins to him. <laughs> really? Same here. Yeah. And Dudley's just like, Shut it. <laughs> Nobody can call me that but my mom. But Harry's done. He is just done with everything this day. And he's just like, Well, then how about Popkins? Mm-hmm. Or Dinky Diddy Dums? Can I use those? <laughs> 
And Dudley wisely just ignores him. He doesn't yeah. say anything. This time it's Harry poking the bear. It is totally Harry poking the bear. Mm -hmm. And this is when Harry is just like, so beating up another 10 year old tonight. I know you did Mark Evans two nights ago. And book Dudley's just like, yeah, well, he deserved it. And it's similar, but the tone is completely different. Yeah. At least how I read it. I mm. think it came across completely different in the book than they did it in the movie. Because honestly, movie Dudley, total douchebag of assholes. Mm -hmm. But book Dudley has not leveled up that much. He might have grown out of his backpack, but it's really Harry who has the best insults and sass in this chapter. Not that hard when it's against Dudley, but... Still, he kind of goes for blood. Yeah. Harry wants to know why he deserved it. And Dudley's like, he cheeked me. Which, this is a little bit more lighthearted in the book, because Dudley in the movie is just like, this one deserved it. And he just sounded nasty. Yeah. Whereas in the book, he's just like, he cheeked me. Yeah. And I don't care how horrible the cheek was. If you're going to call it a cheek, it sounds adorable. It does. <laughs> he cheeked me. He cheeked me. It sounds like he kissed you on the cheek. He cheeked me. But sassy Harry's just like, did he tell you you look like a pig that's been taught to walk on its hind legs? Because that's not a cheek, dud. That's true. Oh. And why didn't we get this line in the movie? Because Yates doesn't love us or want us to be happy. Apparently. Honestly. <laughs> Should have been in the movie. Should have. But I think maybe they were trying to be quicker to the fact that Dudley's just an asshole. I think that they wanted you to think Dudley was the asshole and have sympathy for the Harry. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. More sympathy for the Harry. Like, you're always going to have sympathy for Harry, but more so Yeah. this time. I just missed that sass. Although that line was pretty mean. That was going deep, man. Yeah. Whew. Hit him where it hurts. Hell yeah. Especially after he got that pigtail removed. Yeah. <laughs> That'll bring back some memories. It's a nice little throwback comment. Mm-hmm. And it does get to Dudley. His jaw starts twitching. Yeah. You can tell he's clenching it. Mm -hmm. But again, he's not stupid enough to attack Harry because Harry is actually dangerous. Yeah. He knows better. Yeah. Like, he doesn't know much, but he knows better than that. And there is a hint. This is therapy to Harry. This is the only therapy he gets. Yeah. There's a hint of satisfaction coming from my life sucks right now. Take it. Take it from me. And he's just pushing it all onto his cousin. Like, ah, I feel better. <laughs> and Dudley's jaw muscle is just twitching. With every twitch, Harry just has to feel this wave of satisfaction. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And they turn down the alleyway where Harry originally saw Sirius. Mm -hmm. And Dudley gets a little brave and is just like, feel like a big man carrying that thing you've been hiding. Seriously, though, like this chapter, kind of oh, fucking no, dirty. It, every single time we were reading the summary, I was like, oh, man, this is the chapter for replacing the word wand with penis. <laughs> Facts. You don't even need to do it in this chapter. It's just there's so many. <laughs> there's just so many moments where I was like. <clears throat> like when Harry tells Dudley that he's not as stupid as he looks and pulls out his wand. <laughs> That's dirty. <laughs> But the two boys start fighting. Dudley tells him, you're not allowed. They'll chuck you out of the school. And Harry's like, how do you know that they haven't changed that rule? And Dudley's like, they haven't. But he's not really sure. Yeah. And they just, they have several go back and forths that I think would have been more fun than what we got. Oh, yeah. But I can see how they were quickly trying to make Dudley the asshole, make Harry the poor Harry. Yeah. Establish and move on. Yeah. That's what they wanted. And they did that. I mean, admittedly. Yeah. Oh, no, it worked. It was effective. I just missed some of this. Yeah. And then Harry taunts his cousin more about beating up people younger than him. Like, oh, you got that championship title in boxing. How old was your opponent? Six? Or like, I don't remember how old he actually said. But yeah. Was your opponent also 10? And he was just like, he was 16 for your information. Was he, though? Was he? Was, was he? he? <laughs> but then, you know, backpack of assholes pulls a Malfoy and says, my father will hear about this, about Harry's yeah. wand being out. <laughs> That's dirty, too. <laughs> I roll my eyes in your general direction. You're going to be doing that a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. But Harry also 
it's Harry doing the mocking here. Mm -hmm. He's now making fun of Dudley for being afraid of Harry's wand. Yeah. And Dudley's just like, well, you're not this brave at night. (laughs) Which just sounds like a really shitty comeback in the book. Because even Harry's just like, "Uh, it is night. That's what we call it when it goes all dark like this. (laughs) Yeah. And Dudley clarifies, no, I mean, when you're in bed. You're not this brave when you're in bed. And Harry's like, what am I supposed to be afraid of pillows or something? He's mocking his cousin for his own pathetic mocking. Mm -hmm. And movie Dudley was not pathetically mocking. He was a douchebag of assholes. Seriously. Straight. Like there was no question about it. At this point, Harry is just completely thinking that his cousin is just an idiot. Mm -hmm. But then his stomach drops when Dudley mentions that he's been talking and moaning in his sleep. And he's just like, fuck. I revisited the graveyard last night. Yeah. Like he actually heard something. Mm -hmm. And then just to really drive that sinking feeling in his stomach home, Dudley starts going, don't kill Cedric. And then does say, who's Cedric, your boyfriend? Yeah. So we have a similarity here. Mm -hmm. I still read the tone completely different. Oh, yeah. In the movie, it seemed like he was mocking him to show off to his friends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Whereas this is more like him almost getting desperate. Yeah. This is almost Dudley getting desperate to just be like, just fuck off. Would you like Like Harry was roasting him? Yeah. And he was just trying to get a zing in somewhere. Yeah. And now Backpack of Assholes realizes that he's hit a nerve. Mm -hmm. So he just keeps going with this line. But I still don't think that it's as bad. He's mocking him, begging his mom and dad for help. Yeah. And at this point, Harry tells him to shut up and points his wand at him. Yeah. This part, I mean, is basically how the movie had it, aside from the fact that they were still in the park with the other douchebags of assholes. And obviously in the book, they're by themselves. Yeah. And not in the park. But again, movie Dudley was way nastier with his comments about Harry's mom. Significantly. Book Dudley was just like, Dad, help me, Dad. He's going to kill me, Dad. Boo-hoo. And that's how it sounded in my head when I read it. Yeah. Oh, Dad, Dad. Yeah. Unlike movie Dudley, who just flat out nastily asks Harry where his mum is. She dead. She dead, Potter. The fuck, guy? Like, that was just fucked up. Yeah. And in front of Dudley's friends, too. So they all start going, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're going to laugh about somebody being an orphan now? Yeah. You are douchebags of assholes. Well, I mean, we already know they beat up fucking 10-year-olds, so. Yeah, touche. But the tone and location are the biggest differences in this section. Mm -hmm. Also, Harry is pointing his wand at Dudley's heart, not jabbing it in his neck meat. Yeah. When he runs up and jabs his wand forward, it hits Dudley on the side of the face and he moves it down really quick. Like Daniel Radcliffe, like fucked up, essentially. <laughs> or maybe he did it once and it really jabbed him in the neck. So they were like, to go to the side first. Yeah. That's a little safer. We're not trying to like take out his vocal cords here. Yeah. He does have a line after this. <laughs> right. We need him to still be able to like do stuff. Tracheotomy Dudley doesn't work in no, the movie. No. Just doesn't. But yeah, pointing his wand at his heart. He doesn't even have to force him back. He's just scared. Like mm-hmm. Dudley is just backing up because he's got a wand pointed at him. And he just backs him into the alley wall. And Harry's just like, God damn it, I wish I could really actually jinx you. But yeah. Despite the fact that he's really angry and frustrated, he knows he can't. And just orders him to never talk about that again. It's just like, do you understand me? Which that right there, that's a do not fuck with me guy. Yeah. And then Dudley's just like, don't point that thing at me. And Harry's just like, I said, do you understand me? And Dudley's like, don't point that thing at me. And they're just like yelling back and forth, repeating the same things. Not actually, Harry doesn't know if he understands him. Dudley's like, don't put the wand on me. (laughs) But then all of a sudden, the backpack of assholes shudders and gasps and everything just goes dark. Which, similar to how the movie had it, half ding, you know. Though since they weren't in an alleyway that could go pitch black, it was just the ominous sky. Yeah. So, kind of close. Dudley's buddies take the fuck off. Understandably. Yeah. As you do. They try to get Dudley to come with them, but Dudley's like looking around with Harry, so they just fuck off. Well, Dudley also thinks Harry did that. Yeah. So, he's not going to be quite as scared. I don't think it clicked for him until 
Harry got scared too. Yeah, true. But while he and Harry stare up at the sky for a moment before also running like bitches. Oh, yeah. Because they just take the fuck off. They hightail it down the dirt road and into an ominously lit underground crosswalk as the rain begins to pour down. It is quite a shift in the weather. Mm Mm-hmm. They stop in the tunnel, and I've been in underground crosswalks before. This one is not as bad, but they're scary places to begin with. (laughs) (laughs) You kind of don't know who's hiding where sometimes on these things. Or what, in this case. In this case, it's what. So it's already creepy as hell, but then you add in the lights start flickering, and it becomes very unseasonably chilly. (laughs) So chilly... The frost begins to form and their breath becomes visible. And those are not good things to see when previously it was 90-something degrees. No. But this at least puts them in a similar setting to the alley. True. It's not the same, but it's hafting. Hafting. (laughs) But Harry's worst fear is realized when he looks around and sees a goddamn dementor hanging out on the ceiling ready to suck their damn faces off because apparently according to david yates dementors still fly they don't fucking fly yates god damn it anyway it grabs harry by the neck with its nasty ass leper hand and lifts him up pushing him against the wall like they do do they though in the movie they do (laughs) because they can fucking float and fly and Apparently, they're super ass strong. Apparently. Harry is just barely able to tell Dudley to get the fuck out. But it turns out that the puddle of water on the ground from the rain is now a sheet of ice. And Dudley falls right on his ass. (laughs) Which, kind of funny. And he slides all the way to the other end of the goddamn tunnel. Which, side note, when I first saw the movie... It didn't occur to me that that water spill had turned into ice. And I was like, why the fuck is he sliding? (laughs) Where the fuck is he going? What's going on? I got so confused watching the movie. (laughs) Moving on. And how long before you figured that one out? I choose not to say. I feel I've embarrassed myself enough today. (laughs) Anyway, let's just keep rolling. (laughs) So this is similar to the book, but again, also not. It's kind of a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. here's something that was similar it got cold yes it got dark yes harry briefly thinks that he caused that to happen he's just like what the fuck i don't know how to turn off the stars how could i have (laughs) accidentally done that so i I don't think this was me and then he's like oh shit i think i know what this means and he's looking around trying to see something but dudley is just freaking the fuck out and he's just like what's going on stop doing that stop what are you doing stop doing it and harry's just like would you shut up so i can figure out what's going on Mm -hmm. and dudley's still like no stop i'm gonna hit you i'm gonna tell dad and harry's just like oh my god shut up but then he himself has to shut up because he hears something yeah he hears it exactly what he was dreading the long hoarse rattling breath sucking at the air Mm -hmm. oh And I kind of like, I would have rather had that sound than the jump scare they gave us. Yeah. It's a little more mysterious. It kind of takes you an extra minute. They could have still had that. And then... The sound and then jump scare us. Then the jump scare. Because you're just like, oh shit, Dementor. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they do have the ice sound, the sound of everything frosting over. Yeah. So they have that, but I mean, it's not the same as that rasping breath. It is not. Mm Mm-hmm. It could have been better. Let's face it. And then here's one of the biggest differences. Before Harry can react to that rattling breath, he gets punched in the head by Dudley, who's freaking the fuck out, and knocks him on the ground. He loses his wand. He's like full on Velma-ing on the ground, trying to find his wand, and he's calling his cousin a moron. Yeah. And then he notices that his cousin has taken off running. He like punches and runs. Yeah. But also, I can't say I wouldn't do the same thing. That's fair. He thinks Harry's the one doing this. So he's just like, bam, knocking out. Get the fuck out. Yep. Run. Just fucking run. Cut and run. Punch and run. Uppercut and run. (laughs) Uppercut and run. There it is. In the movie, he doesn't run. He does the slidey thing. On one hand, it's kind of a good thing that he slides on the ice. However, when he gets to the other end of the tunnel, in swoops another fucking Dementor. 
And holy shit, is this bad luck for both of them. Just a little bit. Holy balls. But I mean, it's good luck for the Dementors, I guess, who just start feasting away on all that happiness. Yum. Obviously, the one sucking face with Dudley is in a better position since Dudley has way more happiness in his life. But then again, the one on Harry has better happiness to suck on because Harry's happiness actually means something and it's not brought on by beating up children. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Either way, they're having a grand old time at the feast when Harry finally reaches across his own body to get his wand out of his right pocket with his left hand. <laughs> I mean, I know he's not a genius, but really? Like, he couldn't have grabbed it with his right hand? I it handed it to his left... Uh, whatever. It irritates me for whatever reason. You see his hand against the wall while his other hand is reaching to grab across his body. Like, that just irritates me. But I can't figure out why they would have gone that way. Because even if Harry was actually left-handed... Why would he have had the wand in his right pocket? Yeah. None of it makes sense. What they needed was for the wand to be visible in the shot so you could see his hand grabbing it. But then why wouldn't he have just used the right hand? Just weird. Again, this is another instance of like random shit that didn't need to be weird like that. That just took up stupid extra time for no yeah. damn reason. Ugh. But Harry gets the wand and he legit just pokes the Dementor in his face hole, <laughs> which, considering his inability to verbalize any spells, was for sure the right call, despite seeming really pretty weird. Dementors just seem immune to physical contact, right? Like, maybe it's because they float? I don't know. I don't know, because obviously they can hold him up against a wall by the throat, so you'd think that physical contact could hurt them, but... I guess, but we've never seen them have... Maybe they don't have pain receptors. Well, we've never seen them have physical contact with anyone prior to this. Yeah. Even when they were doing the Dementor's kiss on Sirius, they were hovering above him. They never touched him. Right. You know? I mean, at least in the movie. Maybe, it, maybe it's just because the movie has them fucking flying again. But I just feel like trying to jack a Dementor in the face would either hurt you or just not do anything. Like a ghost or some shit. Like, maybe it only worked because it was Harry's wand and the magic of it was what really did the trick? I don't know. But whatever he does, it works. So yay. Yay. <laughs> because the Dementor lets go of Harry and he drops to the ground, losing his wand on landing. Which kind of lines it up with the book where Harry also dropped his wand, though mm -hmm. this was because Dudley punched him and not because of the Dementor. They really should make like wristbands for wands. <laughs> you, you know, like they had on Wii Motes, so you don't accidentally yeet the damn thing into your TV when you're playing bowling. I have done that before. Right? I think that's brilliant. Right? So yeah, in the book, we've got Harry on the ground mm -hmm. trying to find his wand because Dudley punched him and made him drop it. Totally velming. Totally velming. Mm -hmm. Dudley has taken off running and Harry's just like, you're running right at it. Yeah. <laughs> Which Dudley figures out eventually, even though he can't see it. He gets close to it and feels it for sure. It got colder, I yeah. imagine. There was no ice in the book. I feel like he'd like hit a wall of sadness. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So he hears his cousin stop and then also feels a chill creeping up behind him and is just like, fuck, there's more than one. Mm-hmm. Because he knows there's one down there. Yeah. And now he feels that there's one over here. And he's desperate. So he's just trying to find his wand. Can't see a goddamn thing. It's pitch black. And he just goes, Lumos. And thankfully, his hand was close enough to the wand mm -hmm. that it actually lit it up. And he was able to find it and grab it. Yeah. And so he gets up, turns around, finds himself face to face with the Dementor. Which I feel like is kind of similar to what the movie did. It just had that little bit of drama before with Dudley punching him and him losing his wand then. Yeah. It still had the jump scare. It had the jump scare. So he turns mm -hmm. around, bam, Dementor. But the Dementor is gliding towards him, not flying. Because Dementors don't fucking fly. It also does not grab him by the throat and press him into the wall. Mm -hmm. I'm still not convinced that they can actually do that. I don't think they can. That might have just been movie drama. Yeah. So that might have to be our Potter pondering. I would love to get your opinion on that. Definitely. So it's gliding towards him 
and Harry tries to back away, stumbling, because mm-hmm. fuck. And he pulls out his wand, and he raises his wand to cast Expecto Patronum. And all he gets is some little silvery wisps of vapor. He's out of practice. He's out of practice. I hear it happens to all guys, He's Harry. like, okay, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Expecto Patronum. Some more silvery wisps. Wah, wah. And at this point, the Dementor is close enough that Harry's desperation is growing. He can't find that happiness within him to cast the charm. Mm -hmm. And he finds himself thinking that he's never going to see Ron and Hermione again. But this thought firmly plants their faces in his mind. And with them there... He once more says, Expecto Patronum! And an enormous stag erupts from his wand and chases off the Dementor. And friendship saves the day! Friendship! We have another instance of the book being more dramatic than the movie. What? I know, it's crazy! Because it does not take Harry multiple tries to cast Expecto Patronum. As the Dementor flies back at Harry... He scrambles back and retrieves his wand, pointing it and shouting, Expecto Patronum! And a bright-ass light makes the Dementor fuck off right quick. Yeah. One try. One try, that was it. And Harry then sends that same light after the other Dementor, who is still sucking some Dudley face, and that one fucks off as well. Like it does. Like it does. But Harry rushes to Dudley's side to check on him, but he's interrupted by a tiny old woman walking towards him from the opposite end of the tunnel. Harry addresses her as Mrs. Fig and goes to put his wand away, but she tells him not to because they might come back, which just shocks the fuck out of him since he had no idea that she even knew what a wand was. And this is similar to the book. Mm -hmm. Harry then bellows for the stag to follow him as he runs towards his cousin. And the Patronus goes after the second Dementor, Mm -hmm. which is barely an inch from Dudley's face. And then as soon as they're both gone, the moon, the stars, the street lamp, everything. It's just lights. It's like summer returns. Yeah. Everybody is probably secretly like, damn it, I was enjoying that cold streak. Right. That's how you get sick, though. True. Speaking of sick, Harry is drenched in sweat. Which is probably a combination of, like, nerves, all of that heat, then to cold, back to heat. Mm -hmm. He might be sick here. Yeah. And then on top of that, he is just completely, like, dementors and little whinging, what the fuck? Yeah. And then Dudley's just curled up in a ball, whimpering. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Freezing ass cold. And Harry, he's right there with him, Mm -hmm. bends over to check on him, but is distracted because he hears some footsteps running up behind him. Mm -hmm. Not walking. Super calm and chill in the movie. Somebody comes running up, and that's got to put Harry back on his edge, especially after everything that just happened. So he whirls back around, Mm -hmm. raises his wand, and sees batty old Mrs. Fig, and is immediately like, hide the wand, hide the wand, hide the wand. (laughs) Right? Like, oh shit. Exactly. But she, again, not calmly like she does in the movie, no. is like, don't put it away. What if they come back? There might be more of them. Oh, I'm going to kill Mundungus Fletcher. Who? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, little old lady just meandering down the walkway in the movie. Don't just... put it away, Harry. Not how I imagined no. that. At all. No. She does have the cutest little voice, though. Oh, I love her. <laughs> She's super adorable. Don't put your wand away, Harry. They might come back. Yeah. She gets so much of Mrs. Fig exactly how I expected her. Mm-hmm. I just really wanted her fury at Mundungus Fletcher. Yeah. Like, she has a full freak out that we'll talk about next week. Right? She kind of loses her shit a little yeah. bit. <laughs> And we do have a little bit more from her in the movie next week as well. So we are actually going to talk about her then. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about Harry and Dudley in specific. Yes. The douchebags of assholes didn't really do anything. So 
We're just going to collectively say they were all very douchebaggy. They were. They suited their 90s bad guy. Cookie cutter. Cookie. Yeah. It was just cookie cutter 90s bad guy. Well done, dudes. Like any one of them could have been the bad guy in Karate Kid. Exactly. (laughs) But then, of course, we got to see Daniel Radcliffe returning as Harry Potter. Mm hmm. And he did wonderfully with what he was given. Yeah, my only disappointment here is we didn't get sassy Harry. We got dejected Harry. Mm -hmm. We got chillingly, quietly dangerous Harry. Yeah. And we got shouty Harry when he cast the Patronus, but... Yeah, a little bit, but not the kind of shouty we needed. Not the kind of shouty. No. It wasn't the shouty we needed or deserved. No, but you know what? It's what was given to us. And it's what was given to him. And he did a good job with it, so. And honestly, the emotion on his face, you could see a range of emotions on his face because I was going through and watching very closely so that I could pull the right expression so I could make my should have been in the movie memes. Mm -hmm. And he really went through a lot of range of emotions within one brief second. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, he's getting really good at that kind of stuff at this point Mm -hmm. it's less like squint face (laughs) show emotion he's starting (laughs) to get the more delicate subtle nuances of acting oh my god i was thinking the word nuances and then you said it same wavelength but yeah i thought he came off to a good start in this and we're going to be mentioning things here and there throughout this whole season i guess you could say with this book and movie what with him being the title character i'm sure we'll bring him up again we'll see him once or twice oh and you can't mention one harry without the other we had harry melling absolutely playing dudley dursley once again and he was so like just the way he deadpanned who's cedric your boyfriend yeah the way that he strung the words together and everything Mm -hmm. he's really talented yeah I actually want to talk a little bit more about him next week as well because his I've just been attacked by a Dementor moments were quite delightful as well. So I think we can leave this at this. Yeah. And pick it back up next week. I agree. So let's just roll right into our Potter pondering, Mm -hmm. which is because the book did not give this impression, do you think a Dementor could actually grab you by the throat and press you into a wall? Could a Dementor physically attack you? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. And don't forget, we are now TikToking these as well for our Thoughtful Thursdays. Mm-hmm. So you can find us on TikTok at Just Keep Rolling. And you can stitch your response there as well. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. Bonus points to Jackson Miller for being the first person to stitch with us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It was pretty awesome. It was very exciting to see. But this will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Carly. She writes, My name is Carly Ferguson, and I'm a Hufflepuff and Thunderbird at Ilvermorny. My Patronus is a ragdoll cat, and my wand is ash wood, dragon heartstring core, and eleven and three quarter inches. My sorting hat story starts the same as many, but I love it because it made me who I am today. In 1998, or 1999, I'm literally unsure at this point, my dad brought home a book for us to read together. He gave my siblings a copy to read, and they had finished their copy within a day. I was in kindergarten at the time, so Dad dedicated to reading a chapter a night with me. I was hooked from the last sentence of the first chapter. After my parents divorced and my dad wasn't there to read with me every night, I dove into Harry Potter. I was nine, so I only read the first two over and over. It helped my anxiety, and honestly still does. When Pottermore first released, I stayed up until midnight to get approved to be on. That was when they had those weird chosen-for-you nicknames. I remember being sorted into Hufflepuff and being a little disappointed. However, the more I read, the more I felt connected with it. Today I am a happy Hufflepuff, married to a wonderful Ravenclaw. I still return to Potter every time I need a pick-me-up. 
I listen to the books to go to bed, I read them when I'm anxious, and I love starting a reread in the beginning of autumn. Thank you for sharing your sorting hat story, Carly. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. You can also just message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, Why does Mundungus Fletcher leave his post guarding Harry? The first person who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag undercover will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 2, A Peck of Owls, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.